All right, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Airbus 320 Tech Talk. What do all those buttons do? We are going to discuss some of the placards in the A320 flight deck today. So before I get started, uh, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and hit the subscribe, smash that like button, or uh, hit the notification bell for me. It just, uh, as you know, helps things out here and helps to keep this channel moving forward and uh, keep it exciting for everybody, myself included. So we'll go ahead and jump into the topic of discussion that I got for you today. And, um, like I said, the, the placards here, you know, probably not the most technical or exciting thing to have a discussion about, but there are some interesting things I want to point out to you guys and, and just tell you, you know, once again, like why why are they there? What do we need these for? You know, how do we actually use these every day in our day-to-day our -day operation? So we'll just talk about each of these really fast here. So the first one on the top here, in, in my case here, N365 Victor Alpha, that is the registration number of the aircraft, sometimes called the tail number. And for those of you that don't know, I mean, this is kind of like the license plate on your car. So the, the license plate, um, you know, the, the registration can actually change if there's an ownership change. So it's just kind of issued on a case-by-case -case basis to whoever the, you know, the current operator of the airplane is. So you might see the the same serial number of airplane, you know, throughout the course of its life, uh, take on a different uh, registration number and uh, just kind of an interesting thing you know all the registration numbers in the United States here they start with an N but of course you know if you've observed you know other parts of the world there, there's all sorts of uh, different variations on, on these characters up here that you will see but it, it's kind of used in the same fashion I imagine every every single airline you know uh, around the world so um, like I said you know the, the reason why this is important or the what we actually do to reference this every single day is we'll always uh, actually at the beginning of every single flight we'll we'll check to verify that the, the registration number on the, the flight release that we have is actually the actual registration of the airplane that we're sitting in. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, you know, when you get dispatched, I mean, there's, there's different, you know, technical uh, details that are specific to each airplane, let's say, uh, that, you know, of course, if you had a, a dispatch release for an airplane that you weren't physically in, you know, some of the things wouldn't apply. Like, for example, maybe there was some maintenance completed on, you know, one of the other airplanes, and that's depicted and, and planned for on one of the dispatchers releases that um, might be different, like I said, for the, the actual airplane you're sitting in. So it's actually one of the first things we'll do when we get into the airplane at the beginning of the day is we'll sit down and we'll just verify, okay, are we in the, the actual right uh, aircraft that we're supposed to be in. And I, I know it sounds crazy, but I've actually seen this happen. I remember when I was at my last air carrier, it was a, a bit smaller of an operation. And, you know, we'd come out to these small airports and there'd be like three or four different aircraft sitting, you know, right next to each other. And, you know, you would have to be careful that you're actually walking out to the, the right airplane. Cause it, it, I remember one day, um, I can't remember where, where we were leaving, but the, the operations folks just kind of pointed us over in one direction and said, oh, okay, you know, your, your airplane's over there. So we we get on the thing, we start pre-flighting it, and of course it's you know four or five in the morning, we're all tired, and it it kind of took us a few minutes to to make that uh, comparison, you know, to our dispatch release and the actual airplane that we're sitting in, and, and it was in fact a different one. So it, you know, of course it could be a, a big issue if you were to go off flying in the wrong airplane uh, for obvious reasons. So, like I said, the the registration number. Um, you know, we're, we're referencing that every single time we go out and operate. And, you know, one other thing I wanted to tell you guys about this is, you know, for those of you in the, the general aviation community, you know, most of the time when you're flying your airplanes around, your call sign is actually the tail number uh, of the airplane that you're actually sitting in. And it works quite well in, in that application. But, you know, the reasons why the, the airlines actually use a, a flight number every time they go out and operate is, instead of a, a registration number is because just the dynamic nature of an airplane airline operation let's say i mean you might have a need to swap one airplane out for another and you know for marketing reasons you know flight you know one between city pair a and city pair b is always you know going to stay that same flight number for the the passengers and the, like i said the marketing and the ticketing all this kind of stuff so it'd be very inconvenient if they use the the registration number um as you know the 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 call sign let's say because it would just be constantly you know shifting around potentially and it's just kind of an inefficient way to run things. So that's uh, just a little bit of, of extra there for you. But if you've been wondering about that, that's why the airlines use uh, the, the call signs instead. Uh, the next one to the right of that, uh, this four uh, character, uh, the, these four letters right here, this is our cell call code. And just really briefly, uh, a cell call or selective calling code is used when we're using uh, HF uh, communication. So this is really when we're flying either over oceanic areas or very remote parts of the world where there's no radar. And, and if there is only HF radio coverage as opposed to the VHF radio coverage, which is, you know, of course, common 
as you know, to you know most domestic uh, land masses, let's say, in the places these planes fly. Um, in the HF world, um, this cell call is very helpful, or at least the code is anyways. And, and as you could assume, it's it's specific to the actual aircraft that you're sitting in. And, and the reason why that is is because this, this cell call code is something that a, a radio operator on the ground could actually use to uh, make a selective call to just your aircraft. And you know to, to try to um, explain this a little bit further, um, Earlier on in aviation, when you know there wasn't this cell call system in place, if you were flying over the ocean, you had to listen to the HF frequency that the controlling agency was using for, let's say, like five hours. So if you were flying from California to Hawaii, you were literally just sitting there listening to static the whole time uh, across the ocean, just waiting. If if somebody needed to call you, they would they could call you on this HF radio frequency, and it was just you know, obviously kind of, um, obviously annoying, but, you know, kind of something that, you know, would kind of detract your attention from, you know, everything else that you were doing in the flight deck, maybe. So, um, so at some point in time, they devised this system where the, the selective calling, um, code allows the controller on the ground to actually send, um, kind of like a, think of it like a doorbell. So, um, if you were, you know, flying along and you weren't monitoring, uh, audibly, you know, this, this frequency in the manner that I just described, uh, the controller could just hit that button and it would send this kind of like buzzing sound that alerts you in the cockpit that like, oh, you know, the controller is kind of trying to call me. So you would reach down and configure your communications panel and you could, you know, then at that point bring up the actual uh, audible volume uh, of that frequency that you're actually on. You could, you know, talk to the controllers essentially. So, um, you know, the, the cell call code is something that, you know, you would look up and reference this, you know, an, an initial contact when you first talk to the oceanic controllers, usually um, we'll just convey this information and say, hey, you know, this is our flight number, this is where we're going, and this is our cell call code today. And if you need to get a hold of us, you know, here's the, the code to do so. So uh, that is what that is all about. Next one below here, uh, we just have some, um, some weight limitations. Now, first of all, you know, every airplane that rolls off the assembly line, even though you might have 10 A320s that come out, you know, immediately, you know, in rapid succession right after the other, they all have slightly different weights because of different radios or avionics or slightly different configurations of seats and all kinds of different reasons that, um, you know, might change an aircraft's uh, weight, let's say. So this is actually a very specific number that's that's very specific to the actual tail number or serial number that you're sitting in. So, um, you know, rather than having pilots memorize all this stuff, it, it really would be impossible, you know, if you consider a fleet of, you know, 50, 100 or more airplanes. I mean, it's it's just, you know, impossible for somebody, you know, to remember each and every single one of these digits for every single airplane they might get out and operate. So they, they placard it into the, the flight deck. And, you know, these are just some basic limitations. And I, I will tell you right off the bat, you know, that the taxi takeoff and zero fuel uh, limitations are um, that we're, we're pretty well watched out for in that sense because the dispatcher as they're playing these flights is always looking out for these things uh, to you know safeguard you against potentially being or ending up above one of these weights and you know uh, exceeding a limitation in the airplane but the one that, that we do actually use from time to time that is actually very important is the, the max landing weight and this is one that typically comes into play when something happens that, that it isn't essentially possible for the, the dispatcher to plan on. Uh, and that would be something like a, an emergency that happens early on in the flight. And I could give you a prime example. Um, just a week or two ago, we were operating, um, we were going from the West Coast in California, going to the East Coast. And um, right over central Nevada, we got a frantic call from our flight attendants in the back. And they said that uh, there was a passenger that was having a, a grand mall seizure. So uh, this violent uh, medical episode was unfolding and, and they had made the decision that, you know, we need to divert right away. So um, we made a, just a, a 90 degree turn right to the right. We started to head to Las Vegas where we had station personnel and, and uh, of course, medical attention for this, this gentleman. But uh, in that instance, this was very important as we just took off with a fully loaded airplane with a whole bunch of gas on it. And um, there's actually a checklist if you're going to land overweight, which is something that we needed to do that needs to be run. Uh, before you land in this condition. So, you know, we, we really quickly were able to like, you know, glance up and look at, okay, what's our max landing weight? Where is our weight at right now? There's actually a, a gross weight out or gross weight readout um, uh, down here. Uh, let's see, it's it's in this little field right here and it's just not showing because the airplane's on the ground here and nothing's initialized on the, the flight management computer there. But you, you would basically essentially really quickly look at and compare and say, all right, what is our um, current weight of the airplane right now and what's the max landing weight and are we, we going to be over a limitation here and you know that's just you know one real world example I could tell you that you know when you're you're 
just going here and referencing this landing weight. And, you know, one last thing to, to cap onto all that discussion, if you're curious about it, um, much larger aircraft, they actually have the ability to dump fuel in this sort of situation. Um, now, on the most narrow body aircraft, they actually uh, this, they just haven't built those systems in for whatever reason. It's most of the time it's not as necessary. Uh, and of course, with everything with airplanes, it's just like an added cost to, to have a feature um, on that in the form of you know extra money to produce it and you know maintenance and all this kind of stuff. So, um, like I said, just one little other detail to, to make mention of because you, you you're probably familiar with you know this fact that some airplanes can can dump fuel and others cannot. And uh, like I said, this, this all kind of ties full circle to that example that I gave you of landing in a, an over uh, max landing weight condition. So next one to the right there, we have some speed limitations that, uh, you know, most of the time also these are, um, they're, they're actually depicted on the primary flight display on the speed tape there. So we can kind of see, you know, what point we, we get to in the progression of the acceleration or deceleration where we... Um, you know, or at a uh, speed limitation. There's these little marks on there, which I, I don't have the slide up uh, in handy right now to show you that. But um, most of the time, you're, you're not needing to look over at this placard and, you know, see what those speeds are. Um, the time when this would potentially become useful, though, is let's say there, there was some problem with the, the data outputs, maybe, or, or the screens actually themselves and our primary flight displays, and we didn't actually have these little tick marks that shows us where the, the flap operating speeds are. We can just compare on something like our standby instrument here, you know, what our current speed is and what the limitation is on um, operating those flaps at that setting. So, like I said, just, just a real-world real example I can think of, of when you would actually use that. Uh, the next one here is the RNPAR uh, placard. Uh, what this is is, you know, uh, the, some of the, the most modern forms of uh, approaches that we can shoot are these very like high accuracy GPS essentially or RNAV area navigation approaches that um, they're uh, specifically relying on the, the accuracy of you know all the instruments on the airplane and the, the quality of data signals that come in from the GPS satellites and all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of like this um, very important thing to, to make sure that if we are going to attempt to, to shoot one of these uh, types of approaches. We just need to be in an aircraft that's capable of doing it. And it just makes it really easy and simple for us to look up and glance and, and, and affirm, okay, yeah, we we are in an RNPAR approved airplane. So yes, we can accept this approach or plan for this approach. Uh, or no, we're not in one of these things. We have to do, you know, some other sort of an approach like an ILS or, you know, something else that uh, maybe not might not have the same uh, requirements, let's say. Uh, as uh, what the RNP approaches require for. So uh, that is that. And one last one here. I, I wish I had uh, a different slide for you. Um, I didn't have one of the ETOPS airplanes, um, you know, as part of my uh, the photos that I had taken here a while back. But um, just that, that there is an ETOPS placard in some of the airplanes that we fly that are approved for over auto operations. And, you know, once again, it's just that, that same type of concept that when you get in an airplane, you just need to verify that you're actually on an airplane that's approved for this type of flying because planes that go out and fly over the ocean, they're actually, you know, there's different measures of certification. There's actually different pieces of equipment that need to be on the airplane as opposed to the ones that only fly over land and, and in domestic areas. So just like everything else I've, I've kind of talked about today, it's just all about seeking very, uh, verification really quickly for us as pilots to just affirm that, you know, we're doing the right things essentially with the right plane, you know, in the actual right aircraft. So that's about all I have for you guys today. I hope that all makes sense. If you have questions, go ahead and leave them down in the Q&A section. I uh, hope everybody's off to a great new year. I really appreciate you tuning in and we'll talk to you again real soon.